HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Me, 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 but also you. The Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Powder donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. I have been doing this podcast for, I believe, going on 10 years. And continue to uh, be honored that it is getting the recognition that uh, it is one of the best resources for small business owners and entrepreneurs and business leaders in general. Uh, And that's because of the guests. I've been fortunate over the years to be able to have conversations with some incredible people who have expertise in certain areas of business and they join me for a conversation where they share that expertise so that all of you can do better things in your business. You can get the answers that you need and want uh, in whatever area at the time is of concern for you. Today is no different. Today my guest is Sarah Canaday, keynote speaker, LinkedIn learning instructor, and author. Sarah Canaday is a rare blend of analytical entrepreneur and perceptive warmth. That powerful combination has increasingly made her a go-to resource for helping leaders and high-potential professionals achieve their best. She's a sought-after leadership speaker and educator, serving diverse organizations around the world. In that capacity, she's gained a unique frontline view of leadership and its fascinating evolution. She shares those observations with in-depth analysis in her second book, Leadership Unchained, Defy Conventional Wisdom for Breakthrough Performance, which will be published in 
early 2019, and I believe by this airing, it will have just published. So thanks for joining me today, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Well, I am thrilled to have you here. Leadership is, is one of my favorite topics or uh, the challenges of leadership, I guess I would say. Um, talk to me about why you decided to write this book, if you would. Sure. Um, you know, as, as my bio said, I, I've, I've had this sort of front row seat, right? I've gotten to witness firsthand the tremendous demands and the conditions that uh, I would say were almost plaguing leaders, right? You know, we all talk about the business as much more complex, much more challenging, much more unpredictable. And it seemed that leaders couldn't get traction with the same brand of leadership that may have given them success in the past. So two things happen. One is I began to see that some of these leaders on their own had come up with some almost counterintuitive practices in order to better manage their work and to, to get more meaning out of their work. Um, and then as I witnessed that, I began to see and come up with other practices that may have seemed counterintuitive or unconventional, but absolutely necessary to thrive in today's landscape because it is different. So what's interesting is I remember thinking originally the way I processed the information was I really looked at, wow, I wish I had done X or Y when I was leading, you know, why didn't I think of those things or why was I so committed to these conventional approaches? And then I began to think and realize that I was committed to them because they worked and I was rewarded for them. You know, for, for example, I was not risk averse. I didn't allow my team to make any mistakes. It was all about productivity and performance. And I prided myself on getting X done, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and, <Sure. laughs> um, you know, all these epiphanies started to pile up. And I just, I saw how that old wisdom could actually get in the way of new thinking and, and innovation. And so that's when it hit me that, that uh, these practices were, they were different, in some cases radically different, but they were absolutely necessary based on this new landscape. So one of the things that I love about this is that times do change. And we were in a certain, um, way of being for a pretty long time. And then I feel like the internet happens and all of a sudden it's like lightning speed. Things are changing. We go through this recession, you know, there's just all of this upheaval and people, you know, the way they're rewarded at work changes and pensions go away. And I don't know, there's just like all this craziness. And so I, I, I find it fascinating the people who were able to adapt to the change instead of not being able, you know, being so rigid in, yeah, but this is the way I've always done it. And then really struggling to succeed when everything around them is different. Right. Right. Well, some of the, the conscious practices that I talk about in my book are difficult because we have been so hardwired to do just the opposite. And like I said before, not only are we hardwired, we've been trained and we've been rewarded yeah. to do conventional practices. So, you know, I think when we talk about changing and adapting, you know, we give leaders a lot of credit for doing that or we wonder why more people don't adapt. And that's because there are so many forces that are working to keep us uh, in the old, if you will, uh, rather yeah. than these new approaches. Yeah, yeah, I get that. 
Okay. So, so I am fascinated to hear what some of these strategies are. I don't want you to tell us all of them because sure. I want people to buy your book. Sure. But will you, will you go over a couple of them so people get an idea of what you're talking about? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, the <laughs> probably the most common and the one that I open the book with is this idea of shaking off this deeply ingrained bias for action right? And being able to embrace the strategic pause. And, I, I, you know, to be sure, I want to make clear that this isn't my, uh, I'm not purporting that people do this idea of mindfulness, right? That this is about sitting and uh, meditating, although that's very useful. Uh, I, I describe the strategic pause as a very, um, specific and very tactical type of conscious practice that you should fold into your week or into your day. Because despite what it may look like or feel like, you actually get a lot done when you're taking a strategic pause. So in today's world, we're expected to both do more and think more. <laughs> and, and, and here's the irony, the, the do more, the push harder is not allowing us to think more. So we, we walk through or rather run through our week from meeting to meeting. We are inundated with data. We are inundated and barraged with information and we cannot possibly decipher and, and, and mull through all of this data and what we've heard at meetings and make meaning of those things. Find the nuggets of innovation. Find the connections where there may seemingly not have been connections before if we don't stop and take time to let those percolate and find those connections or make discoveries um, or separate the wheat from the chaff, right? So there's a lot of things that you're actually doing when you're taking the strategic pause. So that's, that's an example. That's one of my favorites. It's so interesting. As you're talking about it, I'm thinking, I wonder if this is why I, my brain works better when I go out of town. Yes, Right? Yes. Like I'm in a hotel room by myself. Mm -hmm. I go to a conference or something. I get so much thinking done and writing done. It's like my brain's been liberated. Yes. When I leave my office. Yes. You're, you're, you're shaking things up. You're, you're changing the scenery. You don't have the typical distractions, I would say. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and I see this constantly. I, I see this, what I call bias for action in not only just individual leaders, but companies and parents and athletes. Um, it, it, it's everywhere. It, it's very ingrained. In fact, I had a, a not too long ago, a recent uh, opportunity to see this in action. I was brought in by a technical uh, technology company to help facilitate a leadership retreat. And as part of that retreat, there was a business simulation that took place in a uh, terrain of um, outdoor terrain with, um, you know, hills and trails. And the whole point of this trail, it was like a scavenger hunt for executives. They were supposed to find these points in the trail and the more points they gathered as a team of three, th the better off they would do. And, and of course they were competing with other pods of three. These executives had two hours to strategize. They were given a map, they were given a set of trail hints, and they were given a compass. And as part of the strategy, I won't bore you with all the details, but I'll tell you that they assigned you know, somebody to the compass holder, somebody to read the, the hint, the trail hints, and interpret them. But one of the biggest things they decided is that they were going to stick together. They were going to stick to their plan. Well, I probably don't have to tell you what happened. The minute we got out on the trail and the whistle blew. 
I, you know, one executive, I'm observing one executive running to one bush saying his gut is telling him this is where the point is. This is where <laughs> we need to be. I had another executive and she was running to, to the other side of the trail. Um, needless to say, they abandoned the two hour strategy. And what was very interesting is when we debriefed the exercise, they recognize that even as a culture, as a company, this is the kind of thing that they were seeing was causing some of their fits and starts in their initiatives and in their plans. They didn't take the time to pivot, refocus, if need be, you know, re-strategize. It was just a go, go, go. So it's, it's an interesting concept and one that, um, you know, it's been around for years. No kidding. Wow. I, I really appreciate that uh, <laughs> visual. Yeah. Because, of course, I, you know, I totally got it in my head. Yes. yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So there's another um, conscious practice that I talk about, and... It is a, a very interesting practice. It's the idea of valuing data, but not being driven by it. Oh. Yes. And, you know, we both know being out there in the business world, it's all about big data. In yeah. fact, you know, the more the better, right? It's, it's a very sexy, a very enticing avenue that I think more and more companies and industries are leaning uh, to. And uh, what's interesting is in my book, I talk about a woman that I researched and, and found. Her name is Trisha Wang. And she was hired by and working for Nokia back in 2009 in their research department. And she was a technology ethnographer. This is similar to a cultural anthropologist. And her job was to identify market trends and potential new customers by analyzing their people's behavior within a certain culture, in this case specifically when it came to cell phone usage. Okay. And she was assigned to study the preferences and habits of low income consumers in China. So she immersed herself in the culture. She spent several years living with Chinese immigrants, um, or migrants rather. She worked as a street vendor selling dumplings. She would go to the local internet cafes and interact with people, ask them a lot of questions. And over several years, she gathered a lot of information. She came up with some profound insights. And here's what she discovered. She discovered that despite their very limited incomes, these Chinese people were so enamored with the new smartphones that they would sacrifice half of everything they earned in a month to have a smartphone. Wow. Yeah. And those who didn't have a smartphone desperately wanted them. The, the demand was enormous. And frankly, it was completely unexpected from this demographic group. So she could not wait to get back to corporate headquarters and share this news with her Nokia executives. Well, they dismissed her findings outright. You know, they said that her qualitative data, her small sample size didn't measure up to the mountains of numbers they had already collected. Data that dictated a strategy to continue to produce full-featured smartphones for high-end users. <laughs> we all remember what happened to Nokia. Yeah. And so that study fascinated me. And I I'll think bet. the same thing happens with companies who... You know, I, I can remember back in my day working at a company and they would hire these consultants to come in and do time and motion studies. And this was very early in my career. And I remember being on the sales floor of this very big company and I was somebody that they sat with to do their time and motion study. And 
they, this went on for weeks. They sat with me, they sat with other top salespeople, they put together, you know, I'm sure a very thick report with lots of bar charts and graphs and uh, came up with, you know, I guess their, their recommendation. But what is amazing to me is that they never asked me, <gasps> the person who was doing the job, any questions, right? And my guess is that the executives who got the report, you know, in their mind, again, we value hard data. Yeah. And what I am purporting in this chapter through a lot of findings and a lot of research is that soft intelligence is just as important as hard data. And so it's the leaders who are now realizing that they need to get behind outside of their desk. They need to question some of the data. They need to personally go out and hear from some of the people that gathered the data. They need to know what their methodology is. They need to go to the very people who were, um, you know, questioned, uh, assessed, uh, and ask them specifically what some of their experiences were, why they gave the responses they did. They need to see their customers using their products and services in their natural habitat. And it doesn't just apply to customers. I think it applies as a leader to your, your uh, employees, right? Yeah, I think we need so, to right. not believe just the data. You need to be asking employees about their experiences directly. So those are two. And, and I think there's a third one that I personally have. I, I'm a work in progress on this third one. Um, okay, wait, and, wait. Before yeah. you do the third one, I have a question for you about the second one. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, do you think that when it comes to all of this data that, leaders will listen to, I'll call them talking heads, even when it's not data gathered within their company or with their clients or their employees, but it's, you know, it's data that's gathered outside and, and people are saying, this is the new wave or, you know, this is what you need to be doing. Do you think they're swayed by that as well? Oh, absolutely. I do. Okay. Absolutely, I do. And I think, again, I talk a lot in my book about the modern leader, right? So yeah. essentially what I'm saying is that the modern leader is the leader who is willing to question conventional wisdom, right? They are relying yeah. on these new practices. They are zigging or zagging when everybody else is zigging type of thing, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is more than just questioning the status quo. These are conscious practices. In fact, they're, like I said, they're practices that are they're somewhat counterintuitive to how we were trained and what we were rewarded for. So yeah, I think leaders who can take the data that's given to them as the latest know to look beyond the data. You know, what, what questions weren't asked? What was the context of how the data was gathered? Are, um, am I only seeing a piece of this data or the results and not the entire picture, right? So yeah. I, I really do think that there is a, a, a tsunami wave of data and we're all getting caught up in it. And the more there I is, know. I think the less likely we are to question it, which is, which is concerning. Yeah, I agree. And I think the less valuable it is. So before you go to the third one, I'm going to take a quick sponsor break. Sure. So, okay. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are The Inside Track by Peter Sage and The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients by David A. Fields. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth 
Explore the books that are of interest to you and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're speaking with Sarah Canaday about leadership and how to defy conventional wisdom to achieve breakthrough performance as a leader. Okay, so before I took that quick little break, um, I, you were getting ready to tell me about the third um, practice and how you are still embracing it. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, always a work in progress. So th th this is interesting. When, when I'm on stage and I'm talking to uh, leaders or, uh, you know, consultants and I want to shake things up a little bit, I'll tell the audience that while I was in the corporate world, I was having an affair. And I let that sit for a minute. <laughs> and then I finish my sentence. I say that I was having an affair with my to-do list. <laughs> and, you know, despite, despite the laughter, I also find that there's a little bit of nervous laughter because I think a lot of people can relate to this, right? Yep. Um, this is something that I've been working on for years, but, you know, we joke, right? We joke about how we, we get such gratification of crossing things off our to-do list. Uh, in my case, when I was in corporate, you know, I was, I wanted to be the person that made it look easy to get things done, that there wasn't anything you couldn't give me that I couldn't accomplish, right? But yeah. then and now, it really has its drawbacks. So what I tell people now is that in this world of overwhelm, always on, always connected, we really have to make everything we do earn its rightful place on our to-do list. Taken one step further, what I started doing two years ago is when I start the year and I have my business plan, I actually put together a stop doing list. Uh -huh. And cool. yes, and it has really helped me achieve my business goals. And I can't take full credit for this. I have to tell you that a couple of years ago, I was planning a retreat with my small team and it was the beginning of the year. It was a business planning meeting. It was kind of a look back at what we've, where we were, what we accomplished, where we were today and where we wanted to move forward. And I had a brilliant colleague who said, you know, I'd be willing to facilitate that meeting for you so you could really participate instead of facilitate. And I said, sure. So he was brilliant at this stuff. And as he drew a pie chart on the whiteboard and we talked about the different arms of my business and which arms of my business I wanted to grow, which ones I wanted to shrink. The, the very next question he asked me was, what are you going to have to stop doing in order to grow in these parts and shrink in these others? And it was the most profound question. He stopped me in my tracks and he was absolutely right. Yeah. It was as much about what I was going to stop doing as what I was going to continue to do. And so this one, I think, you know, it's another one that we are just, we are married to our to-do list. We feel unproductive if we're not adding to our to-do list. And these are things that aren't just daily tasks. I'm talking about even major initiatives that I've seen leaders unwilling to let go of because they worked hard to make them happen. Per perhaps they uh, traded in some professional clout to get the initiative funded, whatever the case is. But there are things you need to look at that may be due for, for, for letting go, for getting rid of. And it's interesting, in the, in the book, I point to companies who have made these extreme decisions to let products go, services go, in order to move their business forward. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the all popular, and I never would have thought this, the new Netflix series from the, 
from the author um, Marie um, and her book, The Joy of Tidying Up. I don't know if you're familiar with this new Netflix series. <laughs> it's taken on a life of its own. Um, and it, and it's, it's funny because I started writing this book at the beginning of 2018 before this was even a Netflix series. And I mentioned her book uh, in, in, my, uh, in this chapter and the idea of, you know, letting things go. I mean, I think Ford Motor Credit or Ford uh, Auto Company is, is a prime example this last year. They made a decision in North America that they were going to stop producing sedans. Sedans, I know. Now, I mean, we don't know if that is going to be a smart move on their part. It would take a crystal ball, but right. it's a prime example of companies who are reconsidering what they've always done. Okay. I, I totally get the company part, and I think Ford's a great example of that, and you're right. We'll, we'll see how that plays Sounds out. Sense. Yeah. Um, because I personally have a Ford sedan that I love and I'm a little annoyed. <laughs> right. <laughs> but having said that, are you including things that the leader should be delegating to somebody else? Or are you talking about just stopping certain practices or behaviors or plans? Or yes, it's, it's a combination. It is, it is, practices that they've continued to do. And in my book, I list a series of sort of filtering questions, like asking yourself, is anybody reading this report that I do every month? Would anybody notice if I didn't do this report? Yeah. Am I doing this report to make somebody else comfortable? Or is it adding value? Is attending this meeting moving my team or my company forward? You know, there are just a number of filtering questions you can ask yourself when you're looking at what makes your calendar or what makes your to-do list mm -hmm. and use those as a filter. And again, like you said, it could be, it could be something as simple as a report that you could delegate or that you need to question the validity of doing all together. Um, but it also could be something bigger. Okay. That makes perfect sense to me. Thank you for that. And, and absolutely. It's funny, I, that the whole meeting thing absolutely popped into my head because that is something that people have meetings just for the sake of having meetings. Yes. And what a waste of time. And right. everybody knows that. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Is, is there, I, I don't want you to give any more of them away because like I said, I want people to read the book, but I am curious if there's a conventional habit that leaders struggle with, you know, one that's really harder to change. I, like I said, I think a lot of these are very much ingrained. You know, one of the things that I see leaders struggle with is this idea of, you know, they are where they are because they have reached a level of expertise, right? They are yeah. subject matter experts. They are now moved in a position to lead others, to make decisions, uh, strategy decisions. And what I talk about in the book is this idea of a black belt right? The analogy of the black belt and how misunderstood that level of sig significance is. You know, people see that as the epitome, the, the final belt in achievement. And really what it means is, yes, it is a belt that has been soiled to the point of being that color because of experience because of trials and tribulations, but it also marks sort of a shift and a new beginning. A leader is really reaches their pinnacle 
as an adult learner, when they're willing to see things with fresh eyes, when they're willing to resign their position as expert, and they are, they are wanting to expand their own perspective. They're wanting to see things with a wider angled lens or with a new lens. And that I think is a struggle for leaders who see the subject matter expert as, as the credibility factor, right? They, they don't want to resign their position as expert and they don't want to appear vulnerable or less than confident in their abilities. And so I think that one is one that people might struggle with when they read that chapter. Um, there may be just some visceral reaction, if you will, to this idea of just opening up and approaching things as, okay, I've reached this level, but now I'm gonna move forward with the idea that I am open to new and different experiences. So I, I, I think this is a huge one. And when I um, teach leaders, one of the things that I tell them, because it, it's something that like always sits in the back of my head is that they are not expected to have all the answers. Right. They're expected to pull the resources together to get the answers. Right. right. So I think a lot of leaders think, well, I'm the one who's supposed to be able to solve everything, which can be a pretty heavy weight. And sure. they're really not. That's not their role in life. That's right. Especially if they are not a functional manager, but more of a general manager. Right. It, it, is, yeah. it, is, it is their, their broader skill set that's in demand. And in fact, if they are conditionally and, and, and consistently giving answers, they're not growing their followers. Right. They're not challenging their followers to come up with their own answers. They're not having conversations about the options uh, available as answers. And so they're limiting the growth of those who follow them. Right. So technically they aren't even mastering the role of leader. That's right. Yeah, that's interesting. That's right. Wow. Huh. And by the way, you know, that is one of the examples that if I look back in my time as a leader, and, and, and I'm going to age myself, but I've been out of corporate now for, gosh, 14 years. Okay. And yes, the climate was different, the business climate. But that is one of the things that I look back and think, I wish I did better as a leader. I wish I put more emphasis on the growth and development of my team. Yeah. I thought my job was, again, to just crank out the results, make sure there were no mistakes coming out of my area. And, you know, as a result, I think I, I lost out on learning and, and my team lost out on some micro, micro innovations. Right. And the company ultimately. And the company. Funny. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will totally date myself. When I um, started in business, it was in the eighties, in the early eighties. And I remember the, the technically I will say the first boss that I had one day said to me, um, do you know what makes me a good manager? And I said, what? And he said that I have people like you who know what they're doing, so I don't need to know everything. Like, he totally got it. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, what, 30 years ago. And right. really totally got it. And he, I would go to him and say, hey, I'm going to do X. And if one day he looks at me, he goes, stop telling me what you're going to do. Stop, you know, stop looking, just go do it. I trust you, go do it. <laughs> yes. Tell me about it later. And right. how empowering was that, that, yes. that I knew someone I respected had respect in me and I was in my twenties, you know, I, it was a great first experience to have. Oh yes. Yeah. It makes a big difference, a big difference. Wow. And it made a big difference for the, for the, for him in his role and, and for the company, for, you know, everyone involved. I'm right. not so sure I did as good of a job as he did <laughs> <laughs> following that and, and, 
you know, growing other people. But having said that, um, okay, so what do you say to someone who feels like they don't really have the luxury to take the time to adopt any of these approaches? Well, it's very interesting because I think that my response would be that they don't have the luxury of relying on their conventional approaches. Really. I mean, again, the backdrop is different. It is demanding a new brand of leadership. So if they continue to approach things the same way, you know, pushing harder, doing more, relying on their own thinking, uh, relying on their typical means of communication, I think they will only be more exhaustive, exhausted, less innovative, and frankly, less fulfilled as a leader. So that feels like that that could be one of those gauges that if someone's listening to this and they stop and they think to themselves, they sort of do the checkoff list. Okay, where am I at with these things? Do I feel like we're achieving the, you know, the level of success we should be achieving? Do I feel fulfilled? Is, is, do I like, you know, am I supercharged to get up in the morning and go do what I have to do? How does my staff feel? You know, all of these things that could show them the, to themselves that it, it's worth doing something different. Yes. And I, like I said, I can, I, I cannot walk into a room, whether I'm speaking or handling a workshop and, and hear from leaders about how overwhelmed they are. Yeah. And they have almost lost the connection to what their purpose is, right? They feel like either walking to-do lists, debriefers, uh, messengers to cascade messages down. Um, and, and so if they wanna be more aligned with, you know, the role of the leader, um, expanding their own thinking, growing others, contributing novel ideas, then I think they need to, to look at their conscious practices and try new ones on. And so absolutely, I think that's one way they can think about it is, is you know, what, do I, what, what does my role feel like right now? Yeah, right. Okay, now, are, do you, are, are you, how do I wanna ask this question? Is it your belief that today's leaders need to embrace all eight? And if so, at the same time? Or is right. it a progression? Or what, what, what is your thought? That is a fabulous question. So I think, you know, in our world, as you know, when it comes to growth and development, I think the, the mistake that we've made in the past is trying to do too much. If leaders focus in and zero in on one or two of these conscious practices, I think they're gonna see tremendous headway. So I don't think that they, as a start, that you have to embody all of these practices, but if you at least try one or two of them, I think it's going to give you a lot of momentum in your role as a leader. And over time, that momentum will lead to, um, you know, a, a willingness and an incentive to try one or two more on, right? Yeah, and right. They will start to build on each other. And I think what's interesting is there's a connection even to some of these and probably most of these. It's just more conscious leadership. It's more um, being more awake and more aware so that you could have more, not only more manageable work, but more meaningful work as a leader. So great question. No, you don't have to have all eight. You don't have to embody all eight, but I, I would suggest starting with one or two, building the momentum, and then keep adding to your conscious practice. 
Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think any leader, um, when they read the book, uh, there are certain ones that will jump out at them, yes. right? Like you're reading it and you go, oh, now that's me. Yes. And that's where you start. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Was there anything that surprised you as a result of writing this book? Not not of necessarily of writing the book, but telling people what I was writing about. Oh. So, yeah, so it would come up, you know, you know this, when, when you're excited about a topic, and even if I was conducting a workshop on another aspect of leadership, I couldn't help but say to, to, to the audience or to, to the small group, oh, and by the way, I'm, I'm working on this new book, and, and part of what I'm working on is, you know, this, this conscious practice of, you know, taking a strategic pause, making an unbreakable appointment with yourself, and, and I would kind of veer off from my topic because I was so excited, I couldn't get over how much it resonated with the leaders. <laughs> You know, so yeah. even though it was off topic, they wanted to talk about it and they wanted yeah. to know more. And so, you know, I had to be careful because I was there to, to talk about a specific <laughs> topic and, and I was excited to, to veer off. But what, it, what was surprising is how much it resonated and how much they wanted to hear more about these practices. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it was not the writing of it. It was more the, the sharing about my experiences in research and writing for the book. Yeah, that's awesome. I can imagine yes. that the, the response, yeah, because everyone's thinking, that's me. It's yep. just like you know, when they go to read it, when you're talking about it, they're thinking, wow, that is exactly what I'm experiencing. And they don't necessarily know why. Like, I'm sure they didn't realize it was because they have these old conventional practices they've been raised with and rewarded for. And so right. they just do them. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And they think they're doing the right thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. Wow. I, I am so, I, I just love this conversation and I am so excited about this book. If there was, this is always my toughy question, um, which is probably why I like asking it. Um, if there was one thing that you wanted people to take away from this conversation, what would it be? Oh, um, I think (laughs) that I, I hope that I've inspired leaders to really think about taking their foot off the gas pedal. Mm. And this idea, I'm going to circle back to what I said at the beginning, this idea of being able to both accomplish more and think more Mm -hmm. because that is what our business climate needs and demands right now is that is that we do both of those and so you know the conversation in the book both i I hope that that's a, a big big takeaway for for listeners and for readers well, it certainly is for me. It, that so resonated with me that, you know, the, the more we're doing, the less we're thinking, and we need to be able to be thinking. In our role as a leader, there's just so much there. It, it's so great. I'm thrilled that you wrote the book because uh, I think it's really timely and yes. really necessary, at, right? As, as we go into the it really realize there's no going back. And right. We, got to do things differently. So, wow. So, so tell the listeners, you know, how they can find the book and how they can find you and, you know, everything you've got going on, please. Certainly. The book, I'm happy to say, will be launched on March 4th. It is already on Amazon, so it can be pre-ordered today. Uh, I also have more about the book on my website. So, uh, Sarah Canada, and there's no H on that Sarah, and Canada is just like Canada with a Y, dot com. And in fact, there is a uh, chapter that they can read on my website if they want to just dip their toe in the water and read a chapter to kind of get a sense of, of what the book will be like. They can uh, avail themselves of that. And I'm happy to connect with anybody on LinkedIn. Um, I do uh, have a 
uh, leadership and career growth uh, newsletter, but I don't inundate my followers with information um, when I feel like I have something worthy to share. So I'm happy to stay connected with uh, folks in any way, shape, or form, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, and also uh, via my website. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for spending oh, time with me today. My really pleasure. That. My pleasure. That's great. And, and I want to thank the listeners, folks, seriously. I, I can feel, I can hear you all doing that big, aha, yeah, that's me kind of thing, because I know <laughs> I did on, on several of those topics. So, uh, you know, do yourself a favor, go over to Amazon, get the book, um, take some time and, and really read it and absorb it, and then uh, start making some changes. Uh, would also like to thank our sponsor. If you would like to get a free trial of audible.com as well as a free audiobook, please go to audibletrial.com slash business growth. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Welcome to Don't Retire, Graduate, the podcast that asks you what you want to be when you grow up so you can graduate into retirement with a purpose and a passion, whether you're 25, 85, or any age in between. Gain actionable financial and mindset tips from your favorite authors, podcasters, and influencers to help you reach that exciting next chapter. Listen now and start building your path to financial freedom and reframing what retirement can mean to you. This is your host, Eric Brotman, reminding you, don't retire, graduate.